Good morning. Please be seated for a little bit here, and then we'll let you play pogo stick. Uh, for those who don't know me, and I think there aren't that many in this group, my name is Reverend Andy O'Dowd. I'm a minister member of the Presbytery. Uh, you usually find me here most Sundays unless I'm preaching somewhere. Normally, you'll see me in jeans. Well, I figured I'm not wearing jeans today, but I don't want to get a rash from not wearing denim. <laughs> So I got a denim shirt on, okay? The glasses are not me trying to be incognito. <laughs> well, thank you. But I did something to abrade one of my eyes during the week, and it has a little bit of a tear in it, and I'm extremely sensitive to light in that eye. These seem to be helping, okay? So I'm hanging in there. If you hadn't noticed on your way in, those of you who know my wife, Rachel, she's in the back row with Joe right now. <laughs> I believe this is your first time in church this calendar year, is it not, dear? Okay, so I'm glad she's here today as well. And as usual, you know, we're open for anybody and everybody. If you can walk, you're breathing, you can get here. Even if you can't walk on your own and somebody has to push you in, you're welcome, no matter who you are. At this point, I believe we're turning to the call to worship. That's you, young lady. Good morning. All the worship which is projected. Come, let's give praise to God together. For God always keeps the promise. Let's sing songs and share joy again. For God always keeps the promise. Let's carry the Spirit into the world with trust. For God, God always, always keeps, keeps the promise. Especially when life gets too hard alone, God, God always keeps, keeps the promise to walk with us. And now if you will all join us in our morning song, I have decided to follow Jesus. And may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all this morning. And also with you. Let's do an about face and say, pass that peace to those who are at home. And then take some time and share the peace with those that are around you this morning. I got to mute first. Yeah, let me mute first. Hmm? 
It is. That's, that's an oldie but a goodie that my mom knows. Like last Sunday, we were singing it in the car on the way here. She said, what are you singing today? And I'm like, oh, you know this one. Oh, yeah. Sunday when I was sitting and waiting to do the odd man, I'm like, I need to stand up, I'm freezing now. <laughs> The scripture today is from Matthew four, chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. As soon as Jesus heard the news of the execution of his cousin, John the Baptist, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. But the crowds heard where he was headed and followed on foot from many towns. Jesus saw the huge crowds as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. That evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, that isn't necessary. You feed them. But we only have five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here, he said. Then he told the people to sit down on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish, looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples 
who distributed it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. About 5,000 men were fed that day, in addition to all the women and children. Normally, this would be the time for the gathering, the young folks. Well, there are no young folks. And Hanson's prone to give you guys that message. Well, what I was going to talk about with them today was the sacrament of communion. It seems sometimes we forget that our kids need to learn what communion is about. And this would have been a great day. In the scripture that you heard, Jesus took the bread when he got it, five loaves, broke it, and distributed it. Well, we still remember that. Only in communion, we remember it in a different way. So that's what you would have heard for a children's message, folks. <laughs> Short and sweet. <laughs> uh, some of you may not realize, but this is absolutely one of the few stories that is in every gospel. Every gospel has a feeding of the 5,000. Some of them also have a feeding of the 3,000 and a couple others as well. But this one is pretty much the same in all four gospels. And when I get a text told that I'm going to preach, I start looking through things that I've used over the years to see one that I haven't delivered it in the same place last week or something. <laughs> and two, to see if there's anything that has kind of changed along the way. He can come up, this, she can come up this way if you want. Won't bother me, I'll talk louder. <laughs> Seriously, I'm serious. If you want to bring her up to the front, it may help her. Yes, it will. <laughs> Experience has taught me. I used to walk and preach with crying babies in my arms. And I found that the closer they are to the front, it's better for their focal point so they can see. Okay, so it wouldn't bother me either way. As I mentioned, this is one of those things that in all my years, I don't think I've ever actually preached on, ever. It seemed a lot of years this was the time when Rachel and I and our family would be gone for a vacation that was also medical stuff at the same time but we would be gone when this would come up in the lectionary. And it's just never worked out for me to be preaching it. But I think we need to really think, look at a couple of different things in this passage. For one, I don't want to focus solely on the bread and the fish, the miracle involved, because I think there's something more we need to learn. We talk about Jesus being fully God and fully human, fully divine and fully human. Part of this passage really locks in on the humanity of Christ. As Jane read it, after this time, the disciples came and told Jesus that John the Baptist had been killed. His cousin, who was about six to nine months older maybe, if even, so what did he do? What would we all do? What would you do if a close family member died and you just heard about it? I don't know about you, but I'd be wanting to go somewhere alone for a little bit. So what did Jesus try to do? Go be alone for a little bit. Did it work? No. But did it upset him? No. He saw all the people around. And like scripture said, he had compassion. He pulled to the shore, taught, healed their sick. And that went on for the whole day. I think Christ's humanity shows in this 
particular passage much more than you see it in other things. The other time I see Christ's humanity is when he loses his temper in the temple. Uh, I mean, that's a totally human action as far as I'm concerned, too. But we have to remember that that humanity is a part of us. Now, last week, I'm pretty sure it was last week, days blur for me sometimes, but Hansen was talking about seeing things that get you so upset that you act stupidly or uninformed or whatever. I think that comes into this a bit too. Jesus never lost sight of being a teacher. And Sylvia, you're going to love this when I get into it a little bit more. <laughs> because not only did he care for them, he was teaching at the same time. And one of the things that really comes out of this scripture for me is a model for ministry. The disciples had been sent away and came back from a ministry trip with news of John. But even here where he's teaching the people, he's also going to be teaching the disciples something. And it's a different model for ministry that I don't think we follow in churches too much. It's a model that goes not on our wealth, but it starts with our poverty. Now, last week, Hanson was talking about something that really gets you so incensed that you, you can't act rationally or think rationally about it when you hear about it. People putting barriers in the middle of the river to prevent migrants coming across or, or refugees or whatever. It, it should incense you. There should be a better way. But in this case, it was the disciples saying, look, Lord, we need to do something. These folks got to go home. They got to eat. It's getting late in the day. They've been here all day listening to you flap your gums. So what was his answer? You give them something to eat. We ain't got any money for that. We don't have that much money in this place. We, we, you know, we follow you. You ain't got no money. We ain't got none. And there's no place to buy it. There's no Smiths down the street. <laughs> you give them something to eat. Now, I do a lot of adult education, and this is the part where Sylvie is going to get really involved. And within the church, you know, we have two kinds of el elders, right? We have ruling elders and teaching elders. Teaching elders sometimes wear these funny things for their collars. In other words, the clergy are called teaching elders. And most of what we're supposed to be doing is teaching our people, teaching them ways to live in light of what Scripture shows, teaching them maybe and helping them think of ways to live in ways that Jesus taught. And one of the things I've learned in some of the teaching I do for adults is something that's called a WIFM, a W-I-I-F-M. In teaching in the corporate world, that comes out as, what's in it for me? And the me is not you, the person that you're teaching. The me is the you, the person that you're working for. So if I was working for this young lady, trying to do something for her, anything I do has to benefit her more than it does me. I'll get a benefit too, because it feels good. But it has to be for that other person's benefit. And when you're trying to minister out of your poverty, Instead of your wealth, you don't have the question anymore of, we can't do that, we can't afford it. Well, that's exactly why you should be doing it, because you can't afford it. There has to be some way to do it. So that's what the apostles were faced with, a situation where there was no way they could afford to do it. But what did they do? They gathered five loaves and two fish. Some accounts say it was from a little boy. Others don't. But those five loaves and two fish were enough for when I did the quick math, if they said 5,000 men 
if you figure they were married, that would be another 5,000 women. That would make it 10,000 already. Even if they had 2.5 kids apiece, that would be another uh, 5,000, you know, another 10, 12 and a half thousand kids. So we're talking 17 to 20,000 people. Does that sound about right? Yeah, it's gotta be kind of close. <laughs> And doing that in ministry is astounding. That is the miraculous part of it. If I was being really sarcastic and talking about feeding the 5,000, and I've had semin seminary professors say this, well, think about the communion that you do in this church. You got a loaf that's this big and you feed about 100 people. <laughs> well, that's being sarcastic. That's not what we're about. Because the other part of doing a ministry, any ministry, whether it's from your poverty or your wealth, is what did they do afterwards? They went and collected leftovers. Right now, the church is doing some of that, right? You have the survey about the worship experience coming. That's collecting leftovers. That's collecting an evaluation of what you're doing. And they had enough to continue and fill 12 baskets full of leftovers. Baskets are not little bitty things like Easter baskets. They're kind of bigger. That is part of the miracle to me, too, and part of the ministry. You give the people something to eat. You give them a with them, something they need. You get rewards, yes. But then after that ministry, you have to evaluate, was it good, was it bad? Did it help somebody or did it hurt them? Because a lot of times the church will try to do something for ministry and it really isn't anything that's good. We try, all the good intentions in the world, but if we don't give them something for them, it doesn't work. Now, I'm not gonna tell anybody how to do the work of the church because I worship here just like you do. It's not a question for me of telling you what to do or how to do it. Just maybe give you an idea to when you see something that really inspires you to go do something and the first thing you say is, we can't afford it. Maybe look twice or three times or a bunch more to see if there is a way that it can be done. And good, bad, or indifferent, gather leftovers. Collect what you've got afterwards. And give thanks to God for the effort that you made in the first place. Because in your own way, you're feeding the 5,000. You're doing the ministry that you didn't think you could do, but their plight moved you to do in the first place. And in doing so, give God all the glory and all the honor, because that's where it belongs, now and forever. Amen. And I believe, yep, this is, we're doing a responsive song here that goes with communion. We're singing three verses before communion, and then we're going to sing another verse after communion. So I'm going to mute myself for the moment.
we turn now to the sacrament. And like I said, Christ blessed and broke bread when he fed the 5,000. And I'm sure the 12 recalled it on that night when he was betrayed for much the same reason. When after the meal, he got together and with a prayer that may have gone something like this in Hebrew, and I'll translate it. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I won't. <laughs> I, I've forgotten half of it. I've forgotten the opening, but the translation is blessed. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, who brings forth bread from the earth to nourish us. And just as Christ broke the bread then, he broke it and said, this is my body that'll be broken for you. And each time you break bread together as a communion of believers, do this in memory of me. In the same way, he took a cup. Again, he gave thanks to God. And he said, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. I want you to do this, my brothers and sisters, and remember me, and remember my blood that will be poured out for you. Well, now each time we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we proclaim his death and resurrection when he comes again in glory. And the way we're going to do this is there are two stations. We're going to have a couple of deacons over here with, for intinction and... The help yourself stuff is over yonder. It's the bread and cups. And we also have some gluten-free. And if there's anyone who needs me to come back to them, please make sure I get word of it and I will bring you and serve you where you're seated. Please come, the meal is prepared.
Okay, before we get deeply into the life of the church, let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks that through the power of your spirit, you have made this cup and the bread become for us the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We give you all blessings and all thanks through him, now and forever. Amen. In terms of items for the life of the church, I will tell you that if this church has ever done anything for you, and in any way inspired you, helped you, strengthened you, give thanks, and we give thanks. I will also thank you for anyone who supports us financially and continues support and makes some of the things the church does possible. As always, online donations are welcome, mail donations are welcome, and there is a basket at the, bank of the back of the sanctuary. Uh, some other things for the life of the church. Announcement-wise, while we've had great success with uh, Catholic Community's refugee resettlement, and I'm sorry, I gotta get to a point where I can see these a little. With folks who've come from Afghanistan, Iraq, and Iraq, and we have folks supporting another family out of the Congo. If you heard how enriching and meaningful that can be, please talk to Hanson if you're interested in helping out or have questions. And I'll have a summer Bible study starting 2 p.m. on Wednesdays in room one or on Zoom. This week is Genesis 37, one through four and 12 to 28. Men's group, the next men's group gathering appears to be a trivia challenge at Uinta Brew Brewing on uh, August 31st at 6.45. And as I mentioned earlier, there is the ongoing worship survey and they want your feedback on how these services impact your life, how they are helpful, what can be done better to give you a more spiritual atmosphere and to feed you. Remember I said, give them something to eat and we're trying. Uh, you can learn more about guns and violence, you know, worship language, etc., on the newsletter or on email. I don't know that I missed anything else, so it's up to you ladies right now. And Excellent. James, <laughs> James, <laughs> sorry. <laughs>
I wasn't given any kind of prayer list, but you know there are always prayer concerns. If you have one and you'd like to make it known right now, please do. And we can offer it up to God together as a group. Are there any prayer concerns to share this morning? Yes, Sylvia. Okay, so Sylvia is voicing a concern for her granddaughter's fiance, who was an EMT with the fires in Columbia, uh, British, in Canada, right? Yeah, British. Uh, British Columbia. I was trying to make sure I had the right place. <laughs> and concern for all those who are battling the fires, all those who are impacted by them, including us guys, because everything comes downstream, uh, and lifting them up in prayer at this point. Other prayers to be lifted up today. Yes, ma'am. So for my daughter, Isabel, she's leaving on Friday for the US, so um, there's always a great trip and a beautiful experience um, during the new year. Okay, prayers for Raquel as she heads to Grenada for her veterinary studies, and she leaves on Friday. Uh, I'm going to mention one here. As many of you know, I work for the VA and work with veteran claims. Well, there's, well, the ninth is the anniversary of the PACT, P-A-C-T, Act. Uh, I'm going to put in a shameless plug, but I think it's probably well-deserved in any event. The PACT Act, if you're not aware, it deals with all the toxic exposures veterans have been experienced, ever. And it's not just one war group or battle group. It's folks, if there are any, from World War II through yesterday. It is a broad action. I kind of give thanks for that act, even though it makes me work three times harder than I want to most days. But because the things as veterans that we get exposed to are above and beyond what you would experience in day-to-day -day living. And we need to remember the veterans and this uh, as well. Others, I also give a joy my wife's here with me today. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Hearing none, let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, we come to you joy-filled at the opportunity to be together in worship and to celebrate the sacrament together. We come to you with concerns for friends, family, relatives, for Raquel as she heads to Grenada, for Sylvia's granddaughter's fiance fighting fires in British Columbia for all our veterans and what they've experienced. But we give you thanks too, Lord, for the tools and the mercy that you have shown us, for the skills you have given us to give care when it's needed, and the way you equip us each day to care for one another. We lift up with joy and with concern the prayers that your spirit will pray for us because they're only in our heart and in our silence. Help us each day, Lord, as we continue to seek ways to minister to those that hurt, to minister to those that need some sign of your love and your care, to minister in ways that are meaningful. Hear us, Lord, too, as we come together with the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Before we join our hands or do whatever you wish as we do that charge, I'm going to give you a benediction today. May our Lord Jesus Christ, who walks on wounded feet, walk beside you every step of your life. May our Lord Jesus Christ, who serves with wounded hands, serve you all your love life long. And may our Lord Jesus Christ, who loves with a wounded heart, be the love of your life forever. Praise God wherever you go. See the face of Christ in everyone you encounter and bring honor and glory to his name. Amen. And now, if you would stand, we're going to charge each other to go out in the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the main heart. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord your God. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. <laughs>